So I just wanted to share a little bit or talk a little bit about some of the trends that I've noticed um, and that seem to be coming up and see if I can reflect uh, my own synthesis of what's happening at the moment. Um, so the first point I wanted to talk a little bit about is, is convergence. Um, Anne used the term integration. Um, I've been thinking about it lately in terms of convergence. And I think what we're exploring here as Dharmic programmers is this uh, certain kind of convergence. Um, we're converging with technology, science, psychology, culture, social justice, business. I mean, really, if you think about any discipline that's part of our human heritage, you know, at some point or another, some, some, some of you guys have talked about the convergence of that with Buddhism. Um, and even Buddhist geek itself, someone pointed out to me recently, it's, it's, it's sort of a linguistic convergence. Um, and some of the most interesting stuff that I see around Dharma punks, secular Buddhists, you know, there are all these linguistic convergences of these two things coming together that you normally wouldn't hear about. Um, and what I think is really interesting about convergence is it's not um, one side of the convergence is sort of informing this other side. Like Buddhists, we have all this stuff to offer these other things. Now, that story is really predominant, I think, especially in the, the Buddhist modernism. Where it's like, we've got all these amazing things that we need to go out and give to the world. You know, uh, it's a kind of evangelism in a certain way. Um, but in reality, convergence is when two sides come together and impact each other. Uh, as David Loy was telling me before, it's like two, two sides are shining a light on each other. And what's interesting about that is that that means that Buddhism is help, helping shape the 21st century, just, just as everything is. Um, there are unique things, presumably, that we have to offer as Buddhists, um, but also is being radically reshaped in that same process. So it's not just that we're going out and sharing all the good Buddhist stuff with the world, but the world is actually changing us in that process. It's changing our understanding of ourselves, changing our understanding of what this tradition is. So in some sense, we could think of ourselves as kind of co-designing um, a new kind of Buddhism together here in this room. And of course, we're not the only ones doing that. There are many people, many groups doing the same thing. And I don't know if you've noticed this, but I heard a couple people commented, and I certainly felt this, that there's sort of like a palpable energy or excitement that sort of comes with this kind of gathering um, I don't know, did anyone notice that sort of energy? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think that energy is a sign of our co-creating or co-designing something new. Because it, it's not fixed. There's something new arising, emerging through this convergence of different perspectives, ideas, approaches, methodologies. And, and, and there's some, we don't know where it's going, fundamentally. Uh, it's like, okay, these things are coming together, we're exploring it, and then the next year we come back, and, and it's changed. We've moved on, something else is happening. Um, that's in stark contrast to how many, uh, as Anne was pointing out, narratives work. You know, they're fixed. There's a way that it is, there are teachers who teach that way, we go learn from them, we replicate their results, and we're done. Final enlightenment, goodbye. You know, <laughs> grab the mic, boom, drop it, we're out. <laughs> You know? <laughs> Which I will do later. Um, and I think what that means is that we have, as David was saying, a huge responsibility because we're co-designing this. And some of what we co-design, frankly, is going to be crap. Um, it's going to not work. It may even cause damage. Um, we have to figure out how to, to, to speed up our learning process so it doesn't cause too much damage, I think. Um, but, but also, there's a huge potential. A potential huge opportunity there for us. So uh, it's so cool to be participating in that. I, I think that's where that feeling comes from. Um, and with some of these convergences, uh, this year, a lot of what we wanted to explore are convergences with things that uh, typically are known as taboos, right? Convergence of Buddhism with sex, convergen convergence of Buddhism with power, the holy trinity, money, sex, power, of course. Um, <laughs> it's the holy trinity of awesome. Um, <laughs> And, you know, here we go. This is the, uh, the, the Holy Trinity embodied in one character, Scarface. <laughs> and I really enjoyed exploring together 
uh, these taboos. You know, I know there's probably much more to go with that. And in many ways, we're, we're sort of lagging behind as uh, the Buddhist cultures are lagging behind with certain things. It's not just that we're like modernized. It's like we're, we're trying to go from like the 1800s to the 1900s still with some of this stuff. And it's kind of embarrassing. Um, <laughs> but this is what we have to work with. Um, so I want to think of the Bodhisattva, you know, as someone who, as Kosho Yuch, uh, Yuchiyama described, as someone who's a true adult. Regarding the question, what is a Bodhisattva? You could also define a Bodhisattva as one who acts as a true adult. Today, most people who are called adults are only pseudo-adults. Uh, I just turned 30, so I guess that means I'm not a pseudo-adult anymore, right? Okay, maybe not. <laughs> Physically, they grow up and become adult, but spiritually, too many people never mature to adulthood. They don't behave as adults in their daily lives. A bodhisattva is one who sees the world through adult eyes and whose actions are the actions of a true adult. That is really what a bodhisattva is. And I would say that in looking at this, these taboos, we're, we're, we're trying to be adults. That's basically what we're doing. We're just saying, hey, this is real. Sexual energy is real. 10% of internet traffic is going to porn sites. That's real. You know, we have to talk about it. We can't just act like our spirituality and our contemplative practice is somehow bringing us to some place that's beyond that. Bullshit. You know, bullshit on, on all of us and bullshit on myself. You know? So we're getting real with, with re these real differences of power, these real differences in privilege, all of that. You know, we have to look at that as adults. And I, I think, you know, what I'm really excited about this year is that we, we sort of broke that open a little bit different way. So I, I noticed... So finally, I want to speak uh, about what's next for Buddhist Geeks. This is our third conference. Um, this, I think, will also be our last broad-themed conference, where we just sort of threw it wide open and explored all these different topics. Um, next year, we're going to be actually focusing on specific topics in more depth, so we can not only kind of throw it open and explore perspectives, but we can kind of dive into a particular topic. So we're talking about things like having a contemplative technologies conference or a mindfulness secularization and the future of Buddhism. You know, how do all these things fit conference? Um, so, so that's kind of part of what's next for Buddhist geeks. And you may have also noticed that we're doing this uh, life retreat program. We just started this. Um, this is sort of our attempt at trying to uh, reinvent the retreat model um, so that it's not this thing that you go do outside of life. Completely. I mean, that's still great. Uh, one of our teachers, Emily and I, said, you know, coming to do retreats is sort of like now, it's sort of like going to Tibet was for their generation. Um, and I think that's actually kind of true. I mean, I go to Tibet still. Um, maybe I'll be one of, one of the few who do in my generation. Um, so we need to find ways to continue to go deep in what's there, um, but not have to necessarily have it look a specific way. In particular, and this is, you know, this is a, also with a lot of appreciation for this model, uh, in, a, in a particular way that's sort of a factory model, where you're sort of popping out all these factories, these retreat factories, and going in and sort of churning through. Um, so part of what we're doing with the life retreat is sort of bringing back a certain quality that may have existed in, in sort of monastery settings of one-on-one -on -one contact, of really talking to each other. That, the weird thing is, though, it's happening on Skype. So it's not the same. But, but, but it's different than if you go to a retreat center and you're just not getting any teacher time. You're sitting on a cushion and you're, you're doing what I think of as the brute force method. You know, you're just putting on all these hours. Uh, well, what about you know, uh, iterative feedback learning where you sort of learn how to practice better quicker and so you don't have to put in so many hours to get the same experience? Um, that's what we're exploring with the life retreat. And then what's next for us uh, now is that we're officially unveiling today here um, the Buddhist Geeks community. So what is the Buddhist Geeks community? I'm just going to say a little bit. This is our sort of what's next, our uh, one last thing moment, if you will. Um, so the Buddhist Geeks community is a cloud-based Sangha. It's not a virtual Sangha quite. It's, it's based in the cloud. And then we, we materialize here in meat space, in physical space, regularly. So, so maybe we exist in the cloud, but but we, uh, we download into a body here, and we, we embody uh, that understanding that we've developed in the cloud. So the Buddhist Geeks community is, put simply, it's a space that we've 
co-designed. We didn't just come up with this ourselves in the laboratory. We actually talked to like 50 Buddhist geeks extensively as we sort of designed this thing. So, so you guys actually helped us design it. Um, and it's essentially a space for us in the cloud to connect with fellow Buddhist geeks and to practice together, to learn together, and to talk together, to connect. So I'm going to go through each of these. The first is practice. This is a graphic from our new community space. Uh, someone created this who is leading what's called an open practice session. You can see here on the bottom. And this is the, our space in the Google Plus community where we sit together. It's a space for us to sit together in real time. So we actually are doing it at the same moment in time. And we're doing it over Google Hangout, which allows 10 people to be in a simultaneous video chat. This is kind of what it looks like. So this is from Friday morning, actually, right before we came to the conference. You can see there's six of us in an open practice room. We have regularly scheduled ones, two a day that are half an hour. And then we also have spontaneous ones. So someone say, hey, 30 minutes from now, I'm going to do a 45-minute open practice. Why don't you join the room? And they set up the Hangout. So what's interesting about this, or what's been interesting, is that you know, we're sitting together in one time, but we're located in multiple spaces. So what people have sort of shared is that there actually is the same sense of sitting together in the same room that you get when you're in a room in a meditation hall together. And yet there's this other dimensionality to it where, um, you know, someone, for instance, could be sitting outside or someone could be sitting there uh, with, the, with the beach as the background. And there's a sense of sharing, actually, these different spaces together hearing sounds from these different places in the world. And, and, and much of our community is spread out uh, internationally throughout, the, throughout everywhere. So, so I think you know, something that's emerging here is this deeper sense of interconnection um, that maybe isn't possible when we sit together in the same room, in the same space. Um, I don't know. You can come sit with us and see what you think. So that's the first part is open practice. Um, the second part is, <laughs> I had to go back, that's a video. The second part is, is the learning part. So uh, what we're calling this is Buddhist Geeks TV, BGTV. Uh, just a simple way of putting it, it's an interactive video channel that we've created uh, with a multiplicity of shows that are for like hardcore Buddhist geeks, like really nerdy geeks. Um, <laughs> we've got shows like uh, Contemplative Technology, which we've just started, uh, Geeks of the Roundtable, which is an oldie but goodie that we've brought back. Um, and now it's done with uh, multiple people on a Google Hangout. Um, we've also got a show called Practice in Life, which is essentially us inviting different teachers in and, and people being able to ask them questions, not just about meditation practice, but about life. So, you know, what is going on here? Um, and then coming soon, we have a show called Dharma Combat. Uh, we're looking for our first combatants, <laughs> and uh, we want to bring some controversy. Okay, I see a few hands. Um, Daniel Ingram, yep. Um, <laughs> that was the hand I saw. <laughs> and I wanted to share a little clip with you from a recent conversation um, that I had actually this week with uh, media theorist Douglas Rushkoff, who I quoted in the beginning. Um, do we have audio, Kelly? Okay. On one hand, it looks like a throwback, you know, uh, Burning Man has a ton of weird medieval stuff going on there, but it's also futuristic. You know, so what we do is we retrieve some of those um, older things that we've forgotten about and then rebirth them in a new form. Literally, renaissance, a rebirth, right? It's a rebirth of old ideas in a new context. So, you know, we get to bring back some of the greatest hits from the past and, um, and, reconstitute them in a way that's appropriate to to our future that's awesome i feel like in in some ways that's that's sort of the core mission of what we're doing with buddhist geeks is how do you do that with a, a wisdom tradition like buddhism so uh, yeah thank you these are great thoughts it is. buddhist it, geek right buddhist geek is is you know an apparent oxymoron but what buddhist geek really is i mean and and the nlp people neurolinguistic programmers talk about this a lot when you bring together two words that seem opposite it creates a new slot in the brain Right for the new for the new possibility. It's like permaculture. It's like what permaculture? Wait a minute. What? What? It's like yeah. Um, so good luck. <laughs> <laughs> so good luck is what he said. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> and.
And the third part of what we're doing, the third dimension of this, so you could think of sort of Buddhist Geeks TV as a more of a curated or, or almost like a top-down thing. It's like what we've been doing with the podcast, but sort of spread out into more areas and saying, oh, here's who we think are cool people to talk to and are experts or whatever. Um, what we've done, though, and I think this is one of the unique parts of the community, is that we've also opened up a space that's specifically designed for peer-to-peer -peer interaction and self-organizing conversation. Um, and, and this is what we call Buddhist Geeks Hangouts, which is named after uh, the Google Hangout platform. So in terms of the, the Hangouts, the way it works is that a member will suggest an idea. Uh, if there are enough people interested in it, then we'll help them kind of schedule it and co-produce it. And then they get together and they have this conversation. And they have this Hangout. And they learn how to facilitate it. And they learn how to have the conversation wisely. And everyone in this interaction, um, everyone is a teacher in a certain sense, and no one is a teacher. So this is the part that Anne talked about, where um, it's not simply that we're establishing a community where there's a particular thing we're trying to all learn, and there's certain people who just have it worked out. Um, and then we're going to those people and saying, hey, what can I learn? Now, I think that's really valuable. Uh, I'm not trying to get rid of that. Um, I, I've learned a ton that way, and I'm sure most of you have. Um, but, but I think we need to supplement that kind of top-down learning, especially if we're dealing with issues or conversations where not all of us have all the answers because it's arising right now. We're figuring it out right now. Um, so those conversations require a different kind of power structure, a different kind of space with different rules. And so that's why we've created this sort of Buddhist Geeks Hangout space, because we actually think that when we start having conversations together, that something amazing can happen from that. That's much more interesting than if just, you know, Kelly, Emily, Daniel and I are having conversations or whoever. You know, there, there's a lot of wisdom in this room and it needs to be tapped. Uh, it needs to be cultivated. It needs to have a space where it can flourish. So, so Buddhist Geeks Hangouts. Um, these are just a few examples of Hangouts that have already happened or on the schedule. So we've got Dogen and Time. Uh, we have peer-to-peer -peer practice groups people that are getting together, even from multiple uh, practice backgrounds, uh, to talk about what's going on in their practice, to share uh, stories, to stay in touch. We've got a young humans group, which is for people who are 31.5 or below. Um, and, and, we, and we decided that number because, you know, most retreat centers and most communities, they, they have the young humans or young adults or whatever, and there's like 32 or under. And we thought, this is completely arbitrary, you know, it's like 31.5, let's just call it that. <laughs> We've got uh, exploring sleep and dream practices, which uh, Marie Ramos, who's in the front row here, is going to be leading in August. Is it August or September? I already did it, but I... Oh, you already did it? Okay, good. Um, we've got the opening lines of the Diamond Sutra and the handicap of authority. So we're questioning authority in these Hangouts. So that's basically um, Buddhist Geeks Hangouts, and that's basically the current uh, iteration, the current version of Buddhist Geeks community. Um, we're actually still co-designing it. We're still co-creating it. We haven't got it figured out. It's still, still happening. And I want to just invite all of you. Um, you. You are the reason we built this, actually. People came up to us at the last conference, several people, and they're like, hey, I really want to continue this conversation, not just once a year. And we said, okay, well, how the hell are we going to do that? Um, and, and this is what we've come up with, uh, with your input and with your uh, suggestions. And we're open for business. So um, if you have any interest in joining our community, you can go here, put your email address in, and uh, you'll get an invitation to apply. So that's it. That's the community. Um, I wanted to now just sort of uh, thank everybody. Um, and I want to start with um, our partners, again, um, to MailChimp, to Tricycle, to all the other partners who've been supporting us. Uh, I want to uh, sort of thank you for that. Um, Tricycle's been a huge support in us kind of broadening out a little bit and kind of getting, getting what we're doing out there to a broader population. So it's really awesome that they've supported us. Um, Actually, we started Buddhist Geeks in a kind of reaction to, to like Tricycle and Shabala Sun. And we, we sort of we were like, oh, we're not talking about the things we want to talk about. You know, it's like being really adolescent. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, several years later, after some conversations with James Shaheen and Tricycle, I was like, oh, you guys are really cool, actually. 
Um, and, and maybe it wasn't that they were cool suddenly. Maybe it was, okay, I'm using cool again, sorry. Uh, maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe it's just that you know, we've grown up a little bit. Maybe we're, we're, we're sort of growing up as an organization and as a community. Um, so yeah, thank you so much to those people who are supporting us financially. It, uh, we're, we're trying to find a business model or business models that help us sort of preserve the values of Buddhism, but also make it so that we can do this. You know, it takes an incredible amount of work. So these people are kind of helping us figure that out. And finally, I wanted to thank everyone who's here, um, because I think most of the best parts of the conference seem to be happening right outside of those doors. Um, all the conversations, the gaggles of geeks that I walk by, you know, having deep conversation. I saw Lee Brasington and several people talking about jhanas, and then I go by and I see other people talking about social justice, and I'm like, this is insane. And I, and I think maybe one year we could do this and I could not, not participate at all so I could just hang out with everybody because I feel like that was the coolest thing going on. Um, so thank you guys. So, so maybe, maybe we could just sort of a round of applause for ourselves. <laughs> So, so just to close in a kind of um, what I think is a really beautiful Buddhist tradition, uh, the offering of the, of the merits or the blessings or the benefits of our practice here, because I think it's really important that we recognize that, that this is a practice too. You know, getting together, exploring ideas, talking, inquiring, questioning, um, sharing the joys and sorrows of our own practice and lives in a community, um, that this is also a practice. So may the benefit of this gathering, this uh, collective exploration, this practice, this inquiry, uh, may it be for all sentient beings, all living beings um, on earth. And also if the people across the hall uh, have their way on Mars too. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. <laughs> Thank you.